Any paranormal stories on battlefields, military? I am mostly interested in modern ones, like not older than 1980, but old World War stories are welcome too. Ask anybody that was on Al came before we shut it down earlier this year about the spooky crap they've seen around there. The place used to be a train yard before it became an IED factory, which then became a pile of rubble after we bombed the hell out of it. Then we built a base on it. We didn't dig the dead hatches out from under the rubble, we just dealt with the smell of rot and decay. There are tunnels all around underneath that we had orders to shoot anyone who comes up out of them. If any US personnel were messing around in them, they'd get slammed with UCMJ. I've heard stories of phantom firefights with figures that appeared on night vision but not thermals, and when soldiers would do a BDA in the morning they wouldn't find any bodies or blood or brass, but there were fresh bullet holes in the towers. Some of my NCOs were there when the place was first built, and they all agreed the place was cursed. I read this story a couple of days ago here about soldiers in Afghanistan seeing walking humanoid figures without heads through their thermal cams. One of the soldiers who was borderline autistic or something decided to walk towards those humanoids, they were walking towards each other. Apparently he said when he came closer it became more clear and he realized it was basically dead rotting zombie ghost jihadis, he shot one of them and ran away, looked back, and saw that they were eating the dead one. I think it's this one. Now. I had a very good friend who I'll call Sherlock, because he believed very much in similar philosophies to Sherlock, as in, deductive reasoning, the purity of a priori logic. I've heard him over the radio when he's being shot at and having RPGs fired at him, and he sounded as calm and relaxed as somebody on holiday in an ice cream shop, specifying what flavor they wanted, for example Cucumber Crisp 071, I'm under fairly heavy sustained fire, it looks like part of my fuselage just gave way, over. That sort of thing. I'm fairly sure he was slightly autistic because he'd just wait until base told him to pull out or whatever. He also had no mercy. If he had authorization to fire, he'd light them up. No qualms, no limitations. Anyway, I've seen Sherlock quake like a freaking leaf in the winter wind. It must have been around 3 a.m., and there was nothing to do. I was playing poker against the computer and winning, another friend of mine reading Kant on my bed, when he walked into my room. Pretty unusual, because he always knocked. He'd delivered some supplies to an outpost about 70 kilometers away from the main base. Not deep in hostile territory, but hostile enough that you'd expect an RPG or two when you supplied them, or took out the wounded, which is mainly what Sherlock did, even volunteering to do it. He'd sat down in the afternoon, and helped unload the supplies, mainly medical, ammunition, and tools, and stuck around taking requests from the CO, who was running low on water and water purification tablets. A few privates were on duty in the dusk, and one of them freaked, saying he could see something through thermals that he couldn't see in person. This piqued Sherlock's curiosity so he had a look. Sure enough, when he looked through thermals, he could see the shape of a man about 200 meters down the path but looking with binoculars, couldn't see anything, even with night vision. This is quite common in Afghanistan. It's reported uncommonly. Despite being an uncommon event, it's always quite unnerving when it happens, but according to Sherlock, he wasn't unnerved, just his deductive reasoning pricking up. First he thought the thermals were dodgy, so he used another set, then another set. Then he thought the binoculars were bad, so he used another pair, which weren't just thermal imaging, but infrared night vision, rather than the shoddy green tinted type, it was a grayscale type, 
which showed significant detail. Now, on the infrared grayscale he could see it, apparently it was a human in everything other than having a head. The body was human, perfectly proportioned, but there was no head. Now, the other night vision didn't show this. Sherlock, armed with nothing other than our standard issue Browning High Power, and probably just a single magazine, strolled 200 meters down the path to see if he could see anything. Apparently not, though he said it felt unusually chilly, and he did feel quite uneasy. It was on his way back, when he heard soldiers shouting. Looking behind him, he saw four or five putrefied bodies shambling after him. He described the smell as rancid and their look as if they had contracted the vilest leprosy. They were moving pretty quickly, and he could see body parts, fingers, hands, even an entire arm, drop off. When he said they were like the walking dead I felt a chill go up my spine, and my friend reading Kant actually looked up at us. Sherlock said he shouted a warning to the bodies, apparently rotting as if dead for a few days, appendages and torsos swollen from the sun, and as they continued to gain ground on him, began opening fire. Despite one of them being hit several times, losing most of its shoulder, and through the stomach, it single-mindedly continued pursuing Sherlock, who, for the first time ever, sprinted away. A rifleman at the outpost shot them with a more high-powered weapon, and killed, or rather re-killed, one of them. As soon as one of them went lifeless, the others would single-mindedly stuff their faces full of flesh, just tearing it off limbs and bodies. No shame, no disgust. Like they hadn't eaten for days. At this point, the fellow reading Kant, piped up. He'd heard of similar stories in his journeys to outposts, some American soldiers, badly injured and delirious in the sun, told him how they had seen their brothers in arms set upon by filthy Mujahideen, and ripped apart, alive. Limbs ripped from bodies, heads from necks, and how they would rip the flesh off with their long nailed fingers, gouging it out, or bite it off the bones. They had said only fire or high velocity weapons not small arms, could stop them. Afghan soldiers, when mortally wounded, prefer to kill themselves than be captured, because they've heard the stories and know the folklore, it is true they kill themselves. I've seen it. I must also admit, as I became more experienced and hardened to the oddness of Afghanistan, I also heard quite a few of these stories myself, to the point where they don't even worry me anymore. I think I even saw a herd of them rampage through a village. But it's Afghanistan, so they could have been tripping on opiates. Here's a rare story. My granddad told me a strange slash funny story about something that happened to him in Vietnam. Some details I can't recall, but I'll try. Be granddad with granddad squad trapsing though jungle fighting Viet Congs. Starts to get dark so they set up camp for the night. As dawn breaks somebody spots movement a few hundred yards away. Grandad squad shits a brick and finds cover. It looks like a ten-man team in single file coming towards them, cutting through the brush with machetes. Squad decides not to engage and stay in cover. The strangers get closer, apparently on patrol. They get to within a few yards. This is it. It was then that my granddad and the rest of the squad realized. It wasn't people at all. It was a group of monkeys, armed with sticks, on patrol apparently. As the squad watched on. He said that they, the monkeys, kept formation, single file, and almost acted human. Their behavior was intelligent. He wasn't sure if the monkeys were looking for soldiers or food, but the squad thought it better if they stayed hidden and waited for them to pass. The way he told it was better, but the thought of a line of chimps patrolling with sticks always makes me smile. Must have been surreal. 
I was a striker driver in the Kandahar region of Afghanistan. One late night we were out and driving back to the FOB, we were going blackout so no white lights, I was down in the hatch driving via DVE, camera. I swear I saw a bipedal skinny creature with long arms run across the road on my screen. Looked like a skinwalker or some similar cryptid. Not exactly a paranormal story. My neighbor did his military service in a top-tier elite airborne regiment when he was 20 years old, this was in France back in the 80s. Back then there were troubles in New Caledonia, a French island in the middle of Pacific Ocean, locals wanted independence and there was some guerrilla so his regiment was sent there. He doesn't remembers anything from that mission except that he ended up under medical care, everything in his memory is blurry and today he still doesn't knows what happened there, the only thing he managed to know is his medical record, which says he tried to hit his arm with an empty bottle, and tried to stuff the glass in his veins to kill himself. Shortly after that he was fired from the army but nothing else happened, no answers, nothing, in France, you are normally sent in a psychiatric hospital if you try to kill yourself, even if everything from that moment is blurry in his mind, if you ask him how it was, he feels very bad and will cry about it for reasons, he doesn't even understand. Then six months later, he was drinking in a bar with his friends. Two bald men approached and greeted him, they called him by his name and asked if everything was all right, then they left. All right then boys here we go, could not find my pics from the tower during the day, because the phone I had at the time bricked apparently. Pick is from a nearby dam, and like I said nothing too exciting just some crap I've seen. Be me, combat engineer in eastern Afghan land. Platoon got pulled when we got there from our job of route clearance to doing guardian angel, babysitting advisors at COPS and FOBS all over RC East. December of 2018, a couple months of running these missions at a tiny abandoned COP called Naklu, up in the mountains. My squad plus PSG, two infantry squads and the advisor team. An SF team came too, but as soon as we got there they left to kill things I guess, and we didn't see them again until Exfil. We air assault in on Chinooks clear the abandoned COP and occupy it. Divvy up guard shifts and towers my squad has only one since the infantry was there just to do security and our job was to guard the advisors. I decide to pull middle of the night shift to at least give each of my Joes 4 hours of uninterrupted sleep like 1 to 2 or 1 to 3 am. As our time there continues we do a few missions talking to ANA and locals. Pull my guard shifts and start noticing things through my thermals, PVS 20s combo NVG and thermals, while staring off into the nearby ridges and hills. Shambling figures on the hills which made no sense at that time of night miles away from the nearest village. Afghans are a superstitious bunch, no reason to be out there. No tactical movement or normal human walking for that matter. Weird shambling. Ask PSG who had been on two prior deployments about it. Says not to worry about it just some assholes messing around. Get pulled out of there early about 10 days later, because snowstorms were coming in I guess and go back there for a couple days missions after. See posts a few months back about zombies in Afghanistan and it clicks. That place has seen hundreds of years of hatred and ons, it's not unbelievable that some of that crap somehow manifests. Like I said not fancy or exciting just what I saw. Not paranormal, but still slash X tier. Part of a working party in Hellmand whose mission is to sort through palkins full of 10 years of broken gear. Find sheet metal that if you bend it enough it snaps into a permanent crease. Once sheet metal is creased you can snap it back and forth similar to a snap bracket. Working party messes around with funky sheet metal, instead of working creasing all of it. Two days go by and we see a box that's about as loud as a weed whacker, and similar hum, 
shoot 50 to 100 feet in the air then horizontally take off. Get back to Leatherneck, GYSGT gets NJPD and sent home for desks we destroyed. Supposedly we broke the desks, so we could send them to the burn pit instead of all the paperwork to send them home. There were no desks, we assume it was the sheet metal and that it was for that weird drone. Three days after Gunny goes home, we go to hang out with a Halo friend of ours, he's Supply. We show him the manifest and the part number for the sheet metal, it's not in the supply system but it's on the share drive. It's just called sheet, then a weird set of numbers, and another supply number for the item, along with numbers to a bunch of other similar items named sheet, and really boring written reports about the performance of said materials that really doesn't make any sense to any of us, since we're idiot 19 year olds. Supply then uses the supply system to find the item, and the crap costs 280k for a single sheet and it's ordered directly from the manufacturer. Looks up source code and it's a well-no defense company. We know for sure we got gunny burned now but there isn't any more breadcrumbs. Journey over. We go back to the Kens to play Halo. Supply friend comes over way earlier than supply normally does, if supply does at all. Civilian IT seized their computers because of possible hack. Get new PCs the next day, can't access the share drive folder with the reports on the material. Get EOD call. Reported landmine in locals field. Arrive on scene 16 hours late. Local brings us into his house. Gestures to a vase on his mantle and shouts at the turp. Terp says his story doesn't make sense so he goes through it again with the local. Landmine story was bullcrap to get us on scene so we'd deal with his actual problem. Local's dead father is haunting his household and cursing his home and land. Tactical pause. Return to truck and relay. Basically get told that the ball is in our court, but try to help. Ask local what he expected us to do about it. He doesn't know but assumed that we're equipped to handle paranormal phenomena since we have iPods and they have VHS. Ask him how attached to his father's ashes he is. Get him out of my house. Screw it, if we leave now we can still make hot chow. Take the urn into an empty section of field, apply a 40 pound cratering charge and calm the absolute shit out of the restless spirit. Give the local a mountain dew some halal jerky, a glow stick and a little US and Afghan flag pin. Home in time for midnight chow. And that's how I became a ghostbuster. Had artillery, engineers and medics in the barracks, plus smaller support units, houses for the married guys and families, schools, you name it. Stories were legion, and covered numerous locations. Heard a few things when I was there about old stuff, but most of what I can tell happened when I was there. There was also another large Brit barracks about 30 kilometers away, which had its own share of stories. There was an officer's mess at the rear of the barracks, outside the perimeter. One night the guards had someone approach the gate then run off. They called the MPs, who drove around, looking for the person. They spotted them, and called after them, whereupon they ran off. The MPs gave chase, but backed off when they realized they were going at 30 miles per hour, and still not gaining on the person running off. Talking of the MPs, none of them would go upstairs in their building at night after one of them got shoved out of a doorway by some sort of invisible entity one evening. Opposite the MPs building you had the main medical center. This was haunted by a little boy, who was referred to as Jack. No one knew what his origin was, and those who saw him were completely unaware of what they'd seen, until the full circumstances of the sighting were analyzed. For example, the medical center was closed at weekends and secured, with a couple of paramedics inside, on standby. One Saturday, one guy was tidying up and saw Jack standing in the doorway of a waiting room. 
he figured it was a boy who was there because one of his parents had come in for help, and was being treated by the other paramedic. Having finished what he was doing, he went to make a cup of coffee, and found the other medic watching TV, which they'd been doing all afternoon. Another time, when the place was fully manned, Jack was seen running along the corridor of the upper floor by one of the officers, who wanted to know why a child had run past his office door, in what was an off-limits area. From personal experience, I was in the medical center one afternoon, when a woman soldier standing nearby completely freaked out. She said that something slash someone had pulled on the bottom of her jacket. I kept my mouth shut. One time, I was going back to my accommodation late at night, and noticed that in one block, all the lights were on on the top floor. Mentioned it to someone the next day, and was told that the top floor of the block was female accommodation, and that many of them slept with the lights on, as they were scared stiff of whatever. In one of the unit bars, I think it was the medics, they seen some sort of glowing light ball slash orb moving around the room. Meanwhile, in another bar, people kept seeing movement out of the corner of their eye when seated at the bar itself. Most of the time, it was someone entering the room, but on quite a few occasions, people would look around, and nothing was there. Married guys were mostly accommodated in converted barrack blocks at one end of the camp. One guy, a friend of mine, lived in one of them, and had a small son. One evening, having put his son to bed a while back, the boy could be heard chattering away. My friend went to his son's room, and asked him what he was doing so late. The boy pointed to the far side of the room, and told his father that he'd been talking to the soldier. There was also housing outside the perimeter, occupied by officers. One was occupied by a couple who were both serving, and their house had glass panels in some of the doors, so you could see people on the other side of the door. One afternoon, both were working around the house. The wife called out to what she thought was her husband in another room, whose outline she could see through the glass, only to get a reply from behind her. She turned around, saw her husband, then looked back, and whatever it was had gone. One night, the MPs received a call regarding a prowler from one of the married guys. It seemed like someone was running around outside his ground floor flat, banging on the windows one after another, although no one could be seen outside. The MPs turned out, had a look around, found nothing, then went inside to get a few details from the guy that had called the incident in. The soldier, his family and the two MPs all went and sat in the kitchen. With everyone in the same room, someone slash something was seen to walk past the kitchen door. Now for the scary one. I lived in more than one block while I was there, and at one point, moved into one of the old barrack blocks. It was late summer, and still quite warm so, at night, I left the window open, and pushed the quilt down to my thigh, so that if I woke in the middle of the night, and it was cold. I could reach down, and pull the quilt up over me. This went on for a few days, then one night, having been in bed literally a couple of minutes, the quilt came right back up the bed and completely covered me. Cue spooky shiver down spine when watching scary movies, ramped up to epic proportions. I held my ground, nothing more happened, and I went to sleep. At work on Monday, I mentioned this to everyone. Most people had heard strange stories, but no one could figure out why, in an old SS barracks, close to the site of a concentration camp, my experience had involved a goose-feathered uve. Then one of the women said that, in fact, it made perfect sense. She explained that after the liberation of Belsen, there were a lot of people in a bad way and, apparently, some of the barrack blocks were used as hospital blocks. Now, imagine that you're a nurse in a ward, working nights, and one of the sleeping patients has thrown his sheets off. There was another barrack complex not too far away, 
that housed a couple of tank regiments, an infantry battalion, and all the usual support elements. The overall layout was similar to the place that I lived in. I can't remember much about the things that I heard regarding it, but the one that sticks in my mind wasn't actually to do with the barracks, but about London. The guy I heard it from was a civilian interpreter, a steady, well-educated, middle-aged guy. He told me how he'd once been walking in one of the main parks in London, sadly, I can't remember which one, with his wife. He turned to speak to her, and she'd vanished. He then began to look around, and noticed that everyone was wearing old-fashioned clothing. Just as he was wondering what the hell was happening, he looked back to where his wife had been. She was now there again, and everything was back to normal. From his wife's perspective, one moment he was there, then he wasn't, then he was back again. Screw it I'll bite. Be me. Be big strong army man like dad wanted. Sit with a thumb up my ass in crowdest and doing nothing. Deployment starts to wrap up. Time for some leave. JPG. Squad dice go out for hookers and drinks and dumb crap. Don't care, decide to go for a run in a nearby park. It's getting dark but I don't really care. See a dude in black jacket slash pants walking slow up ahead. Move to pass, dude doesn't respond when I say on your left even in my crowdiness. Look over my shoulder, dude is looking down at the ground walking slow. Catch his eyes. Doesn't have any. Start booking it. Look back, he's somehow kept pace but looks like he's still walking slow. Oh crap. PNG. Freaking full on sprint, scared like a mother lover. Round the bend, he's in front of me. Turn around, he's back. Jump into the nearby bushes to cut across the path, probably look like a retard. Few minutes, lungs hurt and nearly pissing myself. See dude standing on the path, not moving. Blink, he's gone. Worst goddamn experience of my life anons, I wish I was getting shot at by Tuscan raiders instead. Army bro here, asked my dad for stories. He was a navy boy during the Cold War and faffed around on a carrier during the 70s 80s. Pressed him for anything he had and his story is mundane but still interesting Imo. Off the east coast. Moving to a different port. Couple of the escorts pull off. Submarine surfaces between the escorts. Dudes get out of sub with big crates slash containers. Armed sailors pick them up, constantly on radios. Immediately sub crash dives the instant it can. Only a couple people on the deck saw it. Again seems mundane but considering all the secretive bull crap that went on it's kinda spoopy. Paranormal, cryptozoology, espionage or MK ultra bull crap, IDK. I'll join in. It's not really all that spooky or interesting but... Be me, who else? Able seaman second class in Her Majesty Queen Lizzie the Lizard's Loyal Royal Navy. That means I was in training at HMS Raleigh. Pretty boring place, very outdated, 50s prefab etc etc. Not been renovated in so long that my old man who was there 20 years prior still remembers some buildings I'm using. Older hands always tell the story of Grubber. Grubber is a naval recruit who went crazy because he couldn't hack it and pulled all the copper out of the back of a television, wrapped himself in it and pushed one end into a plug socket to kill himself. Old hands, lol like four weeks ahead of us, always tell us to keep an eye out for old Grubber. He still stalks the halls they say. If you're out of bed after lights out and creeping around the divisional block with your torch, and you keep real quiet, you can hear him shuffling around in his copper cable bindings they say. 
Some nights lads from different classes will come into your mess in the dead of night dressed like grubber and shake you awake screaming like banshees just for the banter. Problem is that it's just one of those urban legends that each class about just passes on as fact. It's something to mess with new recruits. Like telling weak ones that you have to salute the base commander's cat. Obviously dismiss this as pure nonsense but fun nonsense too. Only interesting thing about it is that when I tell my dad about it, like I said he was in Royal Navy too and was in the same training base as me, he chuckles and says, I remember Grubber. Anyway so far not so spooky but there is a part two. So anyway. Phase one training for the Royal Navy isn't really that bad when I look back on it. But when you're 16 and all you've done is go to school it can be pretty stressful. We get on with it all fairly alright though because we become fast mates except for one. There's this one guy called Leaveham who's always just a bit off. We figure he's a bit of a retard and although we try to keep him cheerful he's just got something off about him. He actually starts really getting into the legend of Grubber even though the rest of us have already realized it's just some spook story. Bear with me I need to dig out some old journals. So anyway like I say. Leaveham is always a bit off. In like week 3 you go off to this crap hole little campsite called Pier Cellars and do team building and you have to do stag which involves taking it in turns to go up to this old school little guard hut for an hour at a time. You get given a wooden L85 and you have to challenge anyone who tries to enter the camp. There's obviously no one in their right mind who would come to this desolate part of Cornwall, but a lot of naval training is done by Royal Marines and they love to mess with absolutely everyone for absolutely no reason. Like I said we had to do this gay as hell stag duty and my turn was as like 3 am. Lo and behold I'm swapping out with Leaveham. Idea is that whoever goes up to the hut has to send the last person back to wake up the next one in line if that makes sense. Guy before leave him and sent to rouse me is a friend of mine, Edmonds. He gives me a little shake. You're up in one hour. It's leave him there now. He's being weird as hell. Want me to come with? Okay I'll wrap this one up because it's not that spooky but at the time I crap my pants. So I get my head down a little longer then go drain the tatties and wander up to the guard hut. It's up a winding country path in pitch black. Nothing spooky about that. The training guard hut is literally three blocks of concrete and an asbestos roof. Leave him is up ahead but he's standing at pure attention facing the tree line opposite. I approach uneasily because I know he's the divisional psycho and I'm not sure anyone can hear me scream back at the camp. How we doing mate? I say as I I light a cigarette. Put that out. He hisses, they're gonna see us. Ok I dot png. I tell him to get back to his rack and give me the gun, remember it's a wooden rifle. He's clutching it like freaking robot zombie aliens are about to spring out of the tree line. Manage to get the rifle off him and send him on his way. Just as he's leaving he whips around and says, Do you think it's true about Grubber? I tell him it's a silly prank eager to get this weirdo out of my hair so I can have a wank and a smoke. He suddenly shines his torch right in my eyes and says, If Grubber isn't true then it will be soon. Then freaking disappears into the foliage. I'll wrap this up now. Leave him backed off into the forest. I sit there in my little guard hut at the age of 16 with no idea what to do. Is this guy having a breakdown? Do I care? Do I have enough Raleigh's to last my watch? I sit with my head against the wall for a long time doing times tables over and over in my head to keep myself awake, old trick. After a while I hear a soft crunch of boots creeping down the road. Slowly shoulder my, lol, wooden rifle. Even though it's fake I might be able to jab leave him in the eye if he comes back being weird. Crunching continues. I expect any minute leave him will appear out of nowhere and try to remove my kidneys. 
Turns out to be Royal Marines trainers trying to sneak up on me to mess with me. I yell out the challenge which they get, deliberately wrong, and I shout out bang bang, correct protocol at the time, which brings everyone running up. Royal Marines congratulate me on murdering a, simulated, group of lost hikers. As they're leaving ask them if they've seen leave ham. This is cause for concern. PNG. Leave ham is found covered in mud and foliage and muttering about grubber. Somehow leave ham is not psych discharged after this little escapade. However he puts together his own little display. Once we're back on the proper base. He takes one of the training rifles. Puts on only his boots and underwear and marches up to the front gate. In the dark the sentry basically sees someone approaching with an L85 L85 wearing only knickers and a pair of boots. The sentry who is actually only an AB1, recently graduated from training, calls out at this weird scary figure as to what the hell he is doing. In the dark all he can see is some freaking weirdos talking about with what looks like a British military issue rifle. Issue's second and final warning. Luckily doesn't open fire. Warrant officer who is also in the guardroom goes out with a goddamn telescopic baton and a pair of cast iron balls. Batters leave him half to death. Leave him is later confirmed to have ripped all of the copper out of one of radios and has wrapped it all around himself and even stabbed the ends into his wrists. So you could say Grubber did exist. Sorry for the long post. But that was pretty spooky to us. Later we found out he had schizophrenia and had slipped through the screening process. Dude literally became the urban legend and we told everybody junior to us the story and they never believed us. Life is strange. This is sort of military but it is a long post, so bear with me. Okay, so about a year ago I used to go on Discord, don't anymore, might go back, who knows been a while, and there was a guy on there. He'd been around for a while and was a bit weird, into languages and stuff. I eventually got promoted to a mod because owner liked me. We got chatting about this dude and a story apparently he came on voice chat one day, said a load of numbers, then quit voice chat. I pranked him by sending him a DM going anon, what do the numbers mean? Couple of weeks passed nothing. I told the mod chat this as a bit of a joke and they went silent. I asked why and they went. You might have pissed him off. And I was like. So what? They then told me he got drunk one night, and basically told them in text that he used to be a mercenary for the White Legion in the Zaire Civil War, and, now to know if this bit is true, lost an arm, I doubt this part of the story and eventually their side lost. In short they said, half serious, he might be able to track me down and kill me, but eventually he replied asking what did I mean and I explained it was a joke. Anyway, another day was talking to him and we were talking about the old European empires and I mentioned how the British Empire technically still has the sun never set on it due to all the islands it has around the world. One of these islands is called Pitcairn Island. Now if you know your history, it was an island settled by British mutineers who took a load of native girls and men from Polynesia as slaves and crap. Long story short, they all killed each other, leaving one dude, his wives, and like a dozen kids. The island is still British held and everybody on it is descended from the original people. All related. It was involved in a mass CP production and abuse thing where like 40% of the island was in on it, but 40% of like 60 people isn't that much. Anyway so my Merc friend happened to go oh I've been to Pitcairn Island. He just left it as that. Now, for reference, Pitcairn Island is 3000 kilometers from the nearest major populated area, New Zealand, and it gets a supply ship something like twice a month the single island shop is only open like three days a week. It's so uninhabited that the island's governor, and by extension British government, will give you free land to go live there. 
lots of it. This is weird in itself. Anyway, I was in another discord and there was an ex-contractor there for the US military, this is a fun story in and of itself, and was talking to him about his work. He said that there are a lot of mercs in the business. He said most of them are Slavic. My merc friend was from Belarus. He said that didn't surprise him. I then mentioned how he went to Pitcairn Island and the guy got spooked. He basically said that all these inhospitable islands are specifically kept because they're out of the way and you can basically get away with anything there if you are the powers that be. He said his ex-contractor buddies would often be used to go to these kind of places for various reasons, he didn't go into it. Out of curiosity I went back to the other discord, pinged the ex merc and asked him what he was doing on Pitcairn Island. He said he didn't want to tell me, but I kept bugging. Eventually he went. Guard duty. And stopped replying after that. So I told my ex-contractor friend and he got even more spooked out. He said it could be anything he was involved in. Could have been human trafficking, a black site drop-off, a hidden lab on the island, unmarked island nearby with such matters, a place to kill people without them being found or possible CP production or arresting of such, see original post. Anyway that's that. It does seem weird that an ex-merc went all the way to one of the most inaccessible places on the planet. The most inaccessible part of the planet is Tristan da Cunha, which is also a British territory. So, dodgy crap in the dark places of the world. Not an active battlefield OP, but slash X slash material. I was in 0317, Scout Sniper for most of my two enlistments and stayed in Okinawa for most of my second enlistment. Most of the marine bases on Okinawa are in the south of the island, which is still mainly jungle. During World War II, the US started the invasion from the north so the civilians moved south for Jap protection. A shit ton of them died from either friendly Jap fire, US mistaking them for Japs or committing suicide to avoid US occupation, they were told they'd be raped when the US came. Being alone for up to a week in there is definitely scary. I used to camp not too far away from some of the training areas and would see shadow people and other apparitions look at me from behind trees at night. I have a few stories I'll unload if anybody is interested. Look up Kadena Air Base if you are into this stuff. I haven't been there long enough to notice anything, but I've heard creepy stories there. I have a few stories, but I'll start off with the one that scared me the most. Spent the past few months accruing leave working at the Jungle Warfare Training Center way up north in the island. Work is really fun, actually. I don't do too much but occasionally teach other snipers how to camouflage and work in the jungle. I had just broken up with one of the cute locals and was pretty bummed out and really didn't want to go to work so I decided to use the two weeks of leave I had, we were in between training cycles and a new sniper had just come to JWTC. Decided to go on a camping trip near the border of the training area. Technically outside of it, but I told a few friends where I was just in case anybody came looking. No guns in Japan, so I couldn't go slash K slash Amando like I would back home. Pack mostly food a small pocket knife, a small thermal scope, one man tent and a life straw. Oki is very rainy during this season, so water wasn't a concern. I also had friends leave a few MREs by the wire so I could grab it if I needed one. I am very experienced in this terrain and I wouldn't recommend most people to do this. Now that I've been out, I think it was very stupid of me to go out on my own in the jungle but I wasn't in the right headspace after the breakup. Anyways, back to the slash x slash crap. I planned for a five day trip and head out midday the first night. Spend most of the day traversing the jungle and avoiding the highways. You're not exactly allowed to just camp in the jungle, but not many people visit the area so it's not a huge concern. 
The sun starts setting through the trees and dark grey clouds with the silver lining start rolling in. We're in for a nice rainstorm. I set up my one-man tent and crack open an MRE. I have an old iPod Nano I bring to the field with me, so I plug in my headphones and listen to some ambient music. I always keep a nudie or swimsuit mag in my kit, so I whip out my sleeping gear and get ready for the night. Start cranking one out to Sayaka Tamaru while listening to the gentle hymn of whales noises and soft raindrops hitting top of the tent. Life's good. Doze off to sleep. Suddenly wake up to a huge weight hitting my legs. Hurts like hell, but the rush of cool water soaking my jeans and shirt feels so much worse. Check my watch. 0200. Unzip my freaking tent and look at what fell on me. The rain is absolutely horrendous and after a few seconds, it feels like I just got out of the pool fully clothed. A good-sized branch landed on my leg, ripping the bottom half of the tent to shreds. Start turning my head to the right when I see a pale girl who looks like my ex peeking around a tree. My blood runs cold. I had been on the island for two years at this point and much of it was in the woods. I had always seen shadows dart of the corner of my visions, but this time I caught one looking straight at me. The girl notices I've made eye contact with her and quickly hides behind the tree. At this point, if I were a slash K slash Amando I would have rushed her or something. But I was freaking scared, so I quickly dipped my head back into the tatters of the tent. Kinda sit there for a moment in awe of what just happened. Don't want to move because I'm too scared. I spend the next 15 minutes staying still and trying to figure out what I should do. Conclude the girl was just a combo of the stress of the situation and some weird coping mechanism for missing my ex. Chills start wearing down and trying to decide whether to stay for one more night than ditch, or start booking it back now. Toyota language and a piercing scream echo through the cacophony of rain and thunder. Ditching this bitch. JPG. Scuffle around my tent gathering anything important. Never got combat deployed, finally my stealthy sniper skills come in handy. Slowly back my bag. Swimsuit mag is drenched and sticky. Can't tell if it's from the rain or come. Thermal scope still works put in my pocket. Sneak my leg through the tears in the tent and kick the branch off. Branch landed right on the nano. Can still hear the sweet whale whispers through the headphones. Shove it in pocket. Everything is packed up and ready, start mentally preparing myself to see this bitch again. Grab one strap of my pack. As my hand is going to down, my hand feels something rubbery and slippery. It's the cotton candy blue pocket pussy from my kit I used earlier. Lift up other hand to unzip the tent. Get up and sling my backpack over my shoulder. Pocket pussy in hand. I always put my head down in the direction I have to travel. I dive into the trees and start booking it. Can't really see or hear anything through the rain. I have a shitty bent flashlight the marines issue us in boot camp on the strap of my pack but decide not to use it. Don't want to see that girl again. Able to keep a decent pace despite the darkness, fog, and rain. Luckily the branch was curved, so its full weight wasn't resting on my legs, or else I'd still be in the tent. Start feeling uneasy. Can't describe it but an intense feeling of dread starts falling over me. I feel like I'm being chased, but I can't see anything after me. Start to get close to the fence line for the training area. Hit the fence about two minutes later. Immediate relief. The fence is about eight feet high and has some old style barbed wire on top. Pack is light AF without the tent or food I left. Throw it over the fence. Thud. Something is behind me. Immediately go prone and whip out the thermal. Scan the tree line with one eye on the thermal and nothing on the other. See a sleek black figure slowly walking 20 to 30 feet between the trees. 
The shadow drips from the gaps of one tree to the next, but it's clearly coming after me. Freak the hell out. Stand up and release a deafening, guttural war cry. Memories of the senseless yelling of Dees at Paris Island flood back. Whip my used pocket pussy in the direction of the figure and climb the fence. Jump down, grab the pack and see the dirt road that leads back to the buildings in the training area. It didn't mess with me for the rest of the way. I'm still unsure if it was something supernatural or if there was just a girl in the woods looking at me. I didn't get to see what clothes she was wearing, but ask anybody who has stayed at Camp Consalvis for more than a few weeks, and they'll have stories of figures in the woods. The United States was never officially in Latvia, or at least in the sense at which I am referencing. I was a tank driver, served in the Gulf War in a Patton, called it O.L. Hickory, and according to medical record, I lost the use of my left knee due to spalling in the driver's compartment. Trouble is, Hickory never got hit with any shells, this thing barely saw combat. Anyways, now that my background is out of the way, back to Latvia. Operation Uthrium was, and technically still is, a large-scale undercover military operation meant to delay slash prevent, differs depending on your department, apparently, housed in the countries directly west of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. We lost Moldova back in 95, in undercover military installations meant to look like factories. Euthrium, in a sense, is a cover story for a cover story. We aren't fighting the Russians, we're fighting with the Russians against something else. Latvia possibly houses a portal to hell, and I drove an M551 Sheridan through it. Questions are welcome, I'll answer to the best of my ability, I'll go into more depth at some point in the next hour or so, I've got to be careful what slash when I post. When I got deployed there, all of the tanks we used were M551 Sheridans, odd, considering by this time they were being phased out in favor of light tanks like the M3 Bradley, most likely due to the fact that they were, to a degree, amphibious. I thought it was for rivers, it wasn't. Couple clicks out from Gotcha, probably misspelled that, we came across a bog slash swamp area about 500 yards across in every direction, to the point that we kinda sat in a peninsula, and were ordered to cross it. We did, after a long while of being semi-stuck on some kind of vines. The water was sour, to the point that it ate away at the paint on the side of the tanks like an acid, and reeked of dead bodies, an aroma I'm unhappily familiar with, which was enough to make most of us pretty sketched out. The Sheridan was a pile of crap, but ours especially was a pile of crap. After getting out of the actual liquid section of the swamp, we threw a track in a bog and had to get out and fix it. Repairs were slow because we had to lift the damn thing out of the bog before we could actually fix the breakage in the track, so I walked off to take a piss and clear my head, get stuffy in that tiny little driver's compartment, and found what I think was the turret of some early World War II panzer of some kind. The turret wasn't broken off, most visual damage was from rust and what seemed to be small arms fire, and it looked like it was actually built into the ground a strategy used to fortify bunkers, used in very good effect by the Russians during the later days of the Second World War. I'm not great on German tank history so I didn't figure out specifically what gun or turret it was, and frankly I didn't really care because we finally retracked the Sheridan. Sheridans aren't great at jungle busting, so progress through the thick forest was slow. At some point we stopped for some reason and got out, I honestly cannot remember why, and our loader, Trevor, we called him Little T, stepped into what we originally thought was one of those Viet Cong style spike traps, but turned out to be some kind of tunnel lined in concrete. Anyways, T broke his ankle because of the awkward fall, and that meant that our gunner would have to do double duty, which he was pissed about. The tunnels were dimly lit, 
and the concrete was covered in a thin layer of dust that burned my nose like something awful when I inhaled, but we pressed on through about a mile and a half of practically nothing, until we hit a cave-in of sorts and had to turn back. From what we could make out the tunnel looked like it was meant for large vehicles, trucks, tanks, etc., but I can't say that with confidence. We never bothered looking down the other end of the tunnel, we just pressed on in our convoy after radio reporting the tunnel to someone else. God, it creeped me out. The World War II stuff continued, we saw a few more of those ground turrets, ran over one, actually, and also ran into a bunker of some kind that I kid you not was lined with skeletons. We crossed through a river into what is technically an island, between Gaja and Lake Burtniks, that smelled like the sour water again. Nothing really happened until we reached the eastern portion of Salika. Salika looked like it got hit with a freaking nuclear bomb, to the point that if I put a black and white filter over an image of it it'd fool people into thinking it was Nagasaki. We drove through Salika as fast as we could, it sketched everyone out, and made it to a small field post where we were gonna stay and set up shop. Near Salika there was a town, emphasis on was, of sorts, few apartment buildings, local grocer, etc., that looked mostly unscathed, if not a little bit battered. The field post didn't have sleeping quarters so we decided to head to the town and try and get some shut-eye. I slept in a tent on the back of the Sheridan over the engine compartment, very pokey, bad decision on my part but it may have saved my life, and the fellas, Trevor, our gunner, our commander and the crew of the Sheridan behind us, slept in an abandoned motel, which we parked in front of. The locals seemed like nice folk, although our new neighbors liked to party a little hard, and it was the first time in a while I felt like I could get a decent night's sleep. Yet I didn't. I rolled over onto what I think was a bracket and the sharp pain it caused woke me up, so I decided to go have a smoke with the fellas, as most of them were still awake, and I hopped out of the tent. Trevor, Gus, our commander, and Heather, the gunner for the other Sheridan I mentioned, said Tank was dubbed the number 37, were gone the other Sheridan's commander Tyler mentioning to me that they spoke of going into town and having some fun because Gus was somewhat fluent in Lithuanian etc etc. I made my way to the crummy little bar that was in town and hung out with the trio for a short while until we came under fire. We never exactly figured out what hit us, but it knocked out the engine on the number 37 and blew its turret clean off, before heavy machine gun fire ripped through most of our convoy. We got the hell out of Dodge, I floored that aluminum freakin' can as fast as it could go until we couldn't see the town anymore. Shit still keeps me up at night. We left Trevor and Heather behind, they were too drunk and wouldn't follow me back to the tank so we left, initially planning to come back for them at dawn. We never got to them in time. When we got to them, they were strung up in a church outside of town, and Christ above I shouldn't, and can't, describe what those bastards did to them. All I can say is that it looked like they got hit by a freaking train, survived, and then were shot to death. I mean god damn it we couldn't even find Trevor's other half. Most of the town's folk vanished, a few militia-esque people took pot shots at our tanks from rooftops, I rammed into a two-story house collapsing it and killing the sniper in the floor above it, but they really didn't do a whole lot. I'm heading into work in about 15 minutes and I don't trust their ISP for crap so it's gonna be until tomorrow-ish before I reply again. Need a minute to calm myself anyways. I'll make it known that I'm Latvian Sheridan crew guy or whatever. I'm back fellas. So we practically wiped that town off of the face of the planet, and after doing so went back to the field post to report in. On our way to the field post we noted tank tracks, definitely not ours as they sank further into the ground and were much wider than our dinky little Sheridan tracks, that led vaguely towards the outpost but swung a left about half a mile out. We radioed what we had seen in, 
and we were ordered to fall back to Carl's turn, our actual field operations post just west of Riga, and started packing our crap up. On our way back, Sheridan No. 4 Babe Ruth dropped its left-hand track into a hole, that turned out to be another section of the tunnels. Eventually, more of the tunnel collapsed and the entire tank dropped into the tunnel, not really suffering major damage other than some external scratching and a worrying clunk coming from the turret ring, so we decided to further explore the tunnel, our reasoning being that our commanding office would like more information regarding said tunnels, and I volunteered he as the driver of number four. This section of the tunnel led to, what seemed like, living quarters, and a loading bay full of old CBE dock trucks and empty drive-in trailers. Other than some German machine guns and a literal ton of ammunition, we didn't find anything, and by this time our repair tank, a retooled pattern with no main gun, had made its way back to us with a crane, and lifted the Sheridan out of there, M551S only weigh in around 15 tons, the crane was rated for 12 but it worked regardless, so we weren't down yet another tank. Took us a while but we made it back to our official command post, a small auto repair shop with a large underground command center, and we were all interviewed as to what the hell happened back in the town. We then came to find out that we lost all contact to the radio center in Moldova, and that a fair few German tanks had been seen in the area. There are theories regarding a Fourth Reich uprising, cultists, and among other things, stuff that would generally fit on a thread like this, but I feel like the bigger issue here is that, according to mainstream sources and world governments, we were never in Latvia to begin with, Salika was never damaged, and no town like the one we took fire in seemed to exist full stop. Be me. On deployment in the Stan. Hot sweaty garbage hole. People were generally nice though. Doing a patrol. Area is more mountain than desert, the whole sandy nightmare pit is a common misconception. Butterbar is in the middle of telling a shitty joke when private starts flipping out. Dumbass starts stumbling down the rock he was crouched on babbling about thermals. He points northeast and we all take a look. I kid you not there's a huge human looking thing crawling up a cliff face. And it's heading up it fast. It gets to the top within 45 seconds of us looking at it and vaults the freaking lip. We end up telling nervous jokes about Haji Spider-Man for the rest of the patrol. Only weird thing I ever witnessed but I'm sure some other bucket head has seen weirder. So here it goes. There's an ISIS stronghold north of Mosul that is notorious for being very difficult to infiltrate. For months no progress is made. Then out of nowhere all attacks stop. Two scouts get sent to check and don't come back. A week goes by and no signs of life in the stronghold. Keep in mind this territory is a few hundred square kilometers and has a few thousand people in it so it should be quite active. Eventually a party of soldiers gets permission to check on the stronghold. They go in. Place is dead silent. They get to a barrack. Open it up and are immediately hit by the smell of rot. A few dozen people have their upper torsos hanging upside down on the ceiling and their lower torsos standing straight up. Some doors were barricaded and blown open. Every person found in that place had the same treatment. Not even women or children were spared. They thought that some extremely violent militia got to them first. But there was no known militias in that area apart from a few YPG parties. There are a few security cameras around the place. All are smashed up. Footage for all cams gets cut at the same time. Somewhere around 2 a.m. No one knows what happened but I've heard people still avoid that place. I got one from my time in the US Embassy. I got chopped over to a new DP battery from Cali as the RO working with FOS. We were doing this two-month field OP at the North Fuji training area. Basic cold weather bullcrap. 
blow up a few targets out in the impact area, stay warm, do this till we go cold for the evening. Well I'm a LCPL so I get the good OL fire watch from balls to 3 one night, so I end up wrapping up, grabbing a pack of reds and pulling a monster to console myself into getting the crap shift. Anyway around 1.30 to 1.45 I'm sitting on the hood of the up-armored Humvee when I see this kid standing near one of the tents we have. Soon as I looked at him I got sick. I mean like vomit inducing sick. Wiped my mouth off confused as freak and I look over and the kid is now standing up on this hill we had been calling fire missions on. This is about a good 100 yards away, and there's no freaking way he sprinted that without making any noise. Put the biggest part that messes with me still to this day was he was full blown ass naked. So I report this to my CPL he thinks I'm messing with him. I show him the exact spots I saw the kid and he dismisses as lack of sleep. Day goes on, we're doing fire missions, trying to stay warm, come evening time we get told who's doing what watch and I get the early one. Cut to it nothing happens. However in the morning while we're having chow one of the other lances asks me if I'd seen some kid wandering around near the hill the night prior. I kid you not my blood was probably as cold as the snow around us. We broke down the area that afternoon and went to a new POS. Few other guys who were there talked about other week's crap they would see or hear at night. This also wouldn't be my last encounter the weird stuff that happened at that position either. Yeah.